Uh, good afternoon, dear students, dear faculty. I will open this forum by welcoming Mrs. Andrea Schenfer. I hope my spelling is correct. Uh, the Deputy Division Chief of the Fiscal Policy and Surveillance Division from the IMF based in Washington. Uh, tonight, Andrea will talk about a very specific topic, and the topic is about uh, significant importance for the future fiscal and economic stability of any economies. She will talk about the role and importance of a fiscal rule in ensuring long-term fiscal and debt sustainability. Uh, we all know that a significant number of developed economies nowadays uh, are facing with fiscal, financial and economic difficulties. And one reason for these troubles is actually the level of indebtedness of these countries and the problem of servicing back the debt. Now, a number of Eurozone economies are revising their fiscal rules or they're actually introducing new ones to reflect new fiscal and economic circumstances. In this context, the government of Kosovo is working to design a fiscal rule which will be applicable for our economy. Andrea is here as a part of an IMF technical assistance mission to assist authorities in adopting the best possible rule. Uh, I guess you might have read also the short view of Andrea, but I will just go briefly uh, through it. Andrea holds a PhD from Würzburg University, Germany, and an MA from Essen University, Germany. She also has made a number of publications and co-authored a textbook. With uh, Andrea, we also have uh, Mr. Attila Arda. He's also part of the IMF mission in Kosovo. Andrea, the floor is yours, and then we can continue with comments and questions. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to, uh, for this opportunity tonight to um, give a short presentation about uh, the topic of fiscal rules. Um, as was said, this is um, a development that we see uh, worldwide these days as response to the fiscal crisis and uh, a response of kind of a forward-looking response of avoiding that these uh, situations uh, occur again in the future. And what I would like uh, to do today is just talk a little bit about international experiences with fiscal rules, especially the, the, the most recent developments, and then draw some lessons also for, for Kosovo and see how uh, some of these lessons uh, can be applied and, and used as an opportunity also for, for the government of <coughs> Kosovo to uh, enshrine some of these, um, these findings in, in, in our legislation. The issues that I'd like to touch upon uh, today. Let well, me just maybe start with the the first one. So I mean the the, the terminology fiscal rules. I mean it's very often used now also in the press when we when we talk about uh, the eurozone. We hear about the Maastricht criteria, fiscal rules, and so on. But what what do we actually mean by fiscal rules? And a definition is a fiscal rule imposes a long-lasting uh, constraint on fiscal policy through numerical limits on uh, big fiscal aggregates. So that means you set a specific ceiling, say for example for the overall debt level, or you set a specific ceiling for the overall uh, budget. And the purpose, and why, um, why are we thinking of constraining the hands of the government in a way by setting these numerical uh, limitations? I think what kind of history or lessons um, uh, we have learned from experience is that there are um, typically we, in, in many economies we see that uh, the debt level has increased over time, but there are very few episodes where the debt level actually has come, come down. I mean, currently we are in a situation in the crisis, debts have come up significantly in, in all advanced economies, but also in, in a number of emerging economies, and governments have to consolidate. But um, so one way of, of helping them to, to do that and really tie their hands are these fiscal rules. So often in the past there, there have been incentives for policy makers to use, say, pre-elections for uh, promises to, to the electorate, increases of particular uh, spending, wages, pensions and so on. And this is difficult to re reverse in hindsight. And another reason why typically there is a bias for deficits to increase is that um, you have so many different uh, interest groups in a way competing for for funds, <coughs> but you know these interest groups are not really internalizing the, the externalities that you know uh, that they have, but they all ask for, for additional funds. So obviously, the externalities are that you have a higher deficit. The higher deficit needs to be financed. Potentially, interest rates increase and so on. And the interest 
interest rate increase might have a negative impact on private investment and then thereby crowd it out. So these externalities are often not internalized by the individual who might be lobbying for one particular expenditure pressure rule. So that's why um, fiscal rules can help in this kind of context. And I said there are um, fiscal rules constrain or put a limit uh, on a broad fiscal aggregate and with the objective of maintaining sustainable public positions for the long run or sustainable debt positions over the long term. So the question is what can you constrain or what should you constrain under what circumstances? And in a way there are four, four big areas. You can either constrain the debt level as such, you can uh, constrain the overall deficit limit, you can make, put constraints on the expenditure side or you can put constraints on the revenue side. Or you can have some kind of combination of these three. So these are, in a way, the, the, the four big relevant uh, variables for, for the debt dynamics. And um, I will show that later on, a lot of countries have limits on the debt, on the overall debt. So in Europe, you had a, a limit of, uh, under Maastricht, nobody should increase debt to more than 60% of GDP. In Kosovo, you have a limit of no more than 40% of GDP for, for the general government. And you find that in a number, number of economies. So that, in a way, is a very direct link to what you want to ultimately achieve. You want to ensure that you are able to repay or not accumulate too much debt that you cannot repay. But obviously, and I think that is a situation that Kosovo is also in right now, if you have relatively low debt at the current situation, and you say, okay, we would, debt should not, uh, in the future, not increase um, to more than 40%, what is guiding fiscal policy in the meantime? So, you know, you might be at 10%, but you have room to up to 40%. How quickly should you accumulate that uh, in the interim? And in, in, uh, for this interim, what could be helpful then is a balanced budget rule, or budget balance rule, where you say, okay, per year, I can only accumulate deficits no bigger of X. And that, in a way, is like a speed limit that you have annually to achieve um, uh, uh, or not go beyond a certain, uh, certain debt target. And I think Kosovo kind of has the luxury right now that it has very low debt levels, but has a lot of development need and investment <coughs> needs. So it could probably accumulate a bit more debt. A lot of other countries are exactly in the opposite uh, situation. They have too much debt, and now they have to define some kind of, uh, in a way, um, speed or path to reduce the debt down, and um, so, so they have to potentially even run surpluses or primary surpluses to actually bring their, their, debt, their debt position down. And then you have two other, um, in a way, <coughs> potential anchors. You can also um, uh, impose a limit on expenditure, and there you can say, okay, either total expenditure or you could say some, some subcomponent of that. And again, that would provide the government some very clear operational guidance. It would in a way, tell the government every year, say, um, the expenditure should not grow more than, um, say, the trend GDP growth. Again, this is something that is now being discussed at, at the, the European level. Um, the problem is if you only impose a limit on expenditure, you're not yet sure that that will actually lead to sustainable fiscal positions. Because what happens if revenue actually increases much less than the limit that you have imposed on expenditure? So what you will need, or, and you find uh, mostly in, in uh, these countries, is they have some kind of combination of expenditure rule with maybe a debt or, or balance budget. And then the, f the fourth rule that you find, but it's actually not a rule that is so much used for ensuring sustainable public finances, are revenue rules. So some countries where the revenue collection is very low, they try to provide some incentives or encourage the revenue collection to, 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 to collect more and they put ceilings and they say we have to achieve at least a minimum of revenue collection of X. Um, again, that obviously helps you but it does not yet ensure necessarily sustainability. Other countries, the Scandinavian countries fall in that area, they say okay we already have relatively big public sectors, we don't want our public sector to, increase, to, to rise more. So they have imposed upper limits on the revenue, say to GDP ratio, say we, we don't want our uh, revenue to increase more or the debt uh, or the, the tax rate actually to be increased. So these are all tools which in a way provide some <coughs> medium orientation 
for fiscal policy. And, and clearly, the, the government is the sovereign and has a sovereign right to decide about how it uses the, the, the resources that it collects from, uh, from its citizens. Um, but at the same time, it also has the obligation also obviously to ensure that future generations have the same rights and, and can use the same uh, resources. And to avoid that, in a way, there's some kind of mismatch and, and eventually the current generation spends too much and then the future generation has to, to, to bear the burden of that, these fiscal rules um, can help and kind of share the burden more, more equitable uh, among the generations. Okay, maybe let me skip this here. And um, so uh, let me maybe jump one slide ahead. And now I'll come back, back to the, the so I've been talking a lot about these, these fiscal rules, and I said it's a kind of a trend that we see a lot of uh, countries using them. And what we've, we've done here is actually, if you're interested, there's a link up there in case you, you have access probably to the, the PowerPoint. Um, we have um, collected a database. We've looked at all the countries who are members of the IMF and have kind of uh, analyzed which of them um, have a fiscal rule in place. And we've described the rules and the characteristics and you, you can find that um, in, just by clicking on this, this world map. And the darker the color here is, the more fiscal rules a country has in, has in place. So there are some countries that not only have, say, a limit on the overall deficit, but they have, in addition, um, the policy makers um, are being told how much they can increase spending every year, or how much they can, uh, what is the debt limit. So for example, for Australia, um, it has, I think, a ceiling on uh, expenditure, the overall uh, budget and uh, the net worth of the government. So, so three, three rules. And in this chart you see that the fiscal rules in a way have become a fashion, so to speak. Um, in the early 90s you, you had hardly any countries with fiscal rules. So, so the, um, uh, the lines here show the number of countries that have fiscal rules in place. So in the early 90s, I think you had only five, five economies. And then uh, this has increased over time, specifically in, in the, the mid-90s. And then again also in the early 2000s, and now again after the crisis. And the reason being, um, there were some, uh, several Latin American countries experienced that crisis in the 90s. So and again, to get their public finances under control, afterwards they adopted fiscal rules. You had in the Scandinavian economies, you had several banking crises. Again, that increased their debt ratios, and afterwards they adopted these, these fiscal rules, which were, has served them very well because, say, in today's crisis, the Netherlands and the, the Scandinavian countries fared much better than other countries, say, Greece, um, uh, that didn't have any fiscal rules. Uh, uh, they hadn't used fiscal rules before. And in the second um, graph on the right hand side, you see that. <coughs> This is not, no longer just a phenomenon in advanced economies. So the advanced economies are uh, the black line. But increase, the, the red line is the, the emerging economy. So they have caught up, as I just said, um, debt, uh, the debt crisis in Latin America and so on. They, they have um, used that uh, as a lesson to, to implement this. Let me go back to this slide. Um, so the question is, um, is, are fiscal rules really kind of the recipe for everyone? Um, you know, is, this, I mean, is it a fashion or I mean, does it work? Or are there certain preconditions that need to be in place to make it work? Um, and I think clearly it depends. Right? So a fiscal rule is not the solution for fiscal indiscipline, but it can help to address uh, the issues. And clearly, I mean, what is very, very important is the political will. I mean, that I think we have seen again and again. Um, so we, some colleagues of mine have also done uh, some studies and they find that countries that have fiscal rules in place are also the ones that uh, on average have lower deficits and on average have lower debt than, those, than the countries without fiscal rules. They also tend to have lower interest rates. But 
what is not quite clear, and we have to be honest about that, is the causality. Is it because a country had a fiscal rule, that's why it has such a good public performance? Or is it because there was already, in a way, a consensus and a, and a conviction by the, the government and by, say, society to be uh, to maintain sound public finances, then on top of that, they adopted, in a way they formalized this, 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 this preference, and they adopted the fiscal rule. And that is very difficult to disentangle. But what we know is, if there is this commitment, and then the rule is used, then it actually also is connected with, with better fiscal performance. Um, but we also see if this, if this commitment is lacking, or if, say, uh, there are certain institutional requirements which are not in place. So if the data are very weak that the, the, the government is reporting, or there are a lot of arrears that can be used to go around a, a certain uh, deficit target, then the rule might not be credible. And if the rule is not, be, not credible, <coughs> then obviously it also may not have any effect of, say, investors who might look at a fiscal rule as an, as an indication that of the seriousness of, of the government. So, so there indeed are, I think, certain preconditions um, that, that need to be con considered. And then clearly also fiscal rules may have some disadvantages one should be aware of. Um, so if you only focus on the overall number and say a minister has to be has been held accountable or you, know, you, you go to the um, European Commission and they send you the blue letter or put you in excessive deficit procedure if you don't fulfill the 3%, Obviously, there's an incentive to see, okay, how can I get around you know, the meeting the 3% requirements? So there might be some intransparent transactions that are then taking place to avoid being, to, to receive this blue letter. Um, and again, if you have good reporting systems, that should help you know, kind of um, uh, counteract these, these tendencies to, to avoid these procedures. But if you don't have that in place, clearly you, you might uh, add some additional interest. But I think the good news for, for Kosovo is that um, the budget institutions that have been put in place here are, are, are very strong. Reporting requirements are good. Um, uh, the the commitments, uh, budget commitments and so on are very strong. So, so from that side, I think we are, we are very comfortable <coughs> that um, we are in a, in a good position um, to, to successfully adopt a, a fiscal rule. So I've already touched upon uh, some of the particular considerations for, for Kosovo. If you were to, um, if, as the current government uh, is, uh, is doing right now, considering uh, to introduce a fiscal rule, this would in a way complement the, the system that already is in place. There's a 40% li debt limit for the general government. But there are also some uh, constraints already in place for the municipalities. So even none of the municipalities have currently incurred debt. Um, uh, they will, they become eligible to do so, but there are also some some limits on them on the debt. So they cannot uh, um, incur debt more than 40% of the own revenues and general grants. And then for short-term debt, there's some additional uh, uh, constraints. And clearly, the, the government has spelled out that it wants to ensure debt sustainability uh, over the medium term, and but it needs some operational guidance. And the fiscal rule can can provide uh, this, this uh, operation. And then the last point is also very important. Clearly, given that there are a lot of investment needs for the economy, a rule needs to consider that also in, in the short term. Uh, again, this is in a way also uh, to show you that Kosovo would be a good international company here if it uh, was to expand its um, uh, fiscal rules uh, uh, system. You see that a lot of countries <coughs> now have more, this is the average number of fiscal rules. And I said in a way you can have four types of fiscal rules. And a lot of economies now have um, more than one. A lot of countries already have two fiscal rules in place. So that would be this the same case then for Kosovo. It has already a debt rule, and on top of that, it would adopt uh, a, a budget balance rule, which um, puts it actually in, in, in uh, the company of a lot of other countries. So this graph shows you um, what type of rules 
are the most uh, popular ones. And you see that balanced budget rules and debt rules, the, first, well, the, the third and the fourth bar on the, on the left graph, are the most widespread uh, spread ones. So there are more than 60 countries in the world that have uh, rules on, on these two areas. And then the other graph, um, and this includes also supranational rules. So this includes the rules under the EU requirements or under other monetary unions, like the Eastern Caribbean uh, Monetary Union. But even if you just look at national rules, uh, the balanced budget and the, the debt rules are the most uh, important ones. Okay, so I already um, kind of alluded to the fact that um, to make a rule successful, <coughs> you need political commitment. <coughs> um, political commitment is one thing, but then obviously you can try to um, also create some safeguards and make a, a rule really binding or create, I mean, make it enforceable. And I mean, I think we have, we have learned the lesson from the EU that we've had the Maastricht criteria in place for quite some time, and nevertheless we had a crisis in Greece or we have a crisis in the entire euro area. And in part that is because um, these the fiscal rules, I would say, were maybe not well defined, so a 3% deficit rule might not have been um, ideal for a country like, like Greece. But it also, I think, was because there was not sufficient enforcement. So when you, when you uh, missed the 3% deficit criterion, you get under the so-called excessive deficit procedure. You commit to reducing your debt on a certain uh, deficit in a certain time frame. Um, and there was, since 2005, also the possibility to impose sanctions, but this has, has never been uh, used in practice. So the, the enforcement was, was relatively weak. And I just wanted to say, if we, later on in the discussions, if you have uh, questions about the EU legal framework, Attila, is, is, that's one of his specialty areas, so we can, we can also discuss a bit uh, more uh, about that. So, so obviously, um, one lesson is, okay, so what, can I make the, the rule more enforceable by putting it in a higher legal um, uh, legal form? So what about putting, um, say, the, the requirement for not having a deficit more than X into the constitution? Because the constitution is not something that the, the current government can just go and easily change. So this is, um, in the past, there were only four countries that actually put their, their fiscal rule in the constitution. You have something in, in Germany, Spain, France, and, and Switzerland. But now under the new EU requirements, actually there is a commitment that also the other members of the Euro area are supposed to uh, adopt national fiscal rules in the constitution or a very high uh, form of legislation that cannot be changed uh, that quickly. But I mean, it doesn't mean that if you have something which is in lower legislation, doesn't work at all because you even have examples uh, again in the Scandinavian countries which didn't even have the rule in, in, in any legal framework, they just had a political or coalition agreement. So at the beginning of a four year coalition time, they wrote a coalition um, contract and they agreed for four years this is the expenditure ceiling for the next four years and this is binding. And it worked reasonably well in these countries. Um, again, they also obviously found some tricks to get around with it, you know, taking something which is on the expenditure side, moving it to the revenue side and renaming it, but overall it, it worked out. Um, another question, again, and that's also a question when you, you say design or a fiscal rule if for Kosovo is, what do you want to capture? Do you want to capture the central government? Or do you also want to uh, capture um, sub-national governments, like the, the municipalities in the case of Kosovo? And we find, and here you see just uh, from international experience, the, the dark blue is countries that cover the general governments, and the other one is the number of um, rules that cover only the central government, and it's, it's split, except for supranational rules where you typically cover the, 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 the general government. I think our view is the broader the coverage, obviously the closer is the link to the, um, to the debt sustainability. And again, it's a lesson that you learn right now from, say, from Spain or from Portugal. All of a sudden, they discover that there are huge deficits at you know, the, the, the regional levels um, where they were not necessarily covered by the fiscal rule before. 
and in a way the, the, the general <coughs> government as a whole has to now deal with the, with the higher def uh, deficit levels. So again, I think uh, we would recommend uh, a broad coverage. Then the question is, okay, but what if your face, doesn't that constrain my hands too much? What if there is some un unforeseen, unusual event? Shouldn't the government have the flexibility to react to that? And we would say, yes, definitely. But what is important is to define these kind of unusual events as much as possible beforehand, and then also define how you would react to that. So say, if there is a natural disaster, um, and you need to have, um, need uh, money for reconstruction. Yes, by all means, you know the government should be able to, to finance that. But obviously, that should be an excuse, say, to move from a deficit of one percent to a deficit of five percent, and then keep it there and say, okay, but now we, you know. <coughs> but so what is important, and again, that's a requirement now under the in the EU, is once you, uh, in a way. Um, use such an escape clause, you should be transparent how quickly you want to reverse your, your non-compliance uh, of the fiscal rule. And this is just a list of examples of countries that have very specifically defined um, their escape clauses. So natural disaster, economic recession, there might be a banking system crisis, uh, or some more technical changes. And um, again, I, I can I think speak from experience from my own country, from Germany, we had a uh, a fiscal rule in our constitution, I think since uh, 69, <laughs> and the rule was violated every second year. And one of the reasons was that our escape clause said if uh, there is a macroeconomic disequilibrium, then you can deviate from, from the rule. And I mean, how do you define a macroeconomic disequilibrium? I mean, you can always uh, find <coughs> reasons and ways uh, uh, to get around it. So clearly, there should be bit more precise definition and then also the government is, in a, is required to explain why, why it deviates. So, and I'm still think, uh, thinking now or talking about how can you enforce a rule um, and, and kind of design the rule and, and provide the safeguards. So another mechanism is um, once you've deviated from a rule and that might be by either because there was some misbehavior in a way, you, you may have increased expenditure uh, or, or revenue just fell, so it might be just bad luck. Um, but how do you get back, or how can you make a country on average not every year have, have bad luck, and say like in the case of Germany where then debt increased every year um, uh, step by step. So I think Germany took a lesson from the, the, the history, from its own history, and said, okay, we have to put in legislation some mechanism that if you, if you deviated from the deficit in one year, <coughs> you have to, in a way, you, be, you will be punished the next year, and you have to undo this, this deviation. And um, so in 2009, Germany adopted uh, a new fiscal rule, again, put it in the constitution, and um, the, the deficit limit is 0.35%, and it's def defined in structural terms. So that deficit uh, corrects for, for the economic uh, cycle. But if, uh, and then if, if you deviate from this particular um, uh, target, um, then the, these deviations are put, so to speak, in a, in a notional account. <coughs> so if you're better than this deficit target, you get a kind of a credit for it. Um, and if you're, if you're worse, that is kind of put on your, on your negative side. And then once you've deviated by too much, then there's an automatic trigger by legislation that the government for the next year then has to reduce the deficit by at least, again, 0.35%. So in that year, for example, uh, might only have to be able to, to run it down as well. And there are other countries which now have built in similar mechanisms. And I think, again, it's drawing the lessons that in the past there were not enough safeguards uh, in, in the system. And also the EU now requires from all the member states to put these kind of automatic triggers into their national rules. Okay, um, another suggestion, how can I enforce fiscal rules is, um, is a question of um, 
in a way, costs that the, the government incurs when it deviates from a rule. So, and, and what is the cost? So, and one of the costs can be reputational costs, right? So if you said you're doing one thing, but you're doing something else, um, the electorate might punish you. But if the electorate doesn't really know what you actually did, it cannot punish you. So how can you make this more transparent? And one suggestion is that, for example, the minister has to explain why the government deviated from, from the budget, yeah, either to the, to, to the parliamentary committee, budget committee, to the, uh, to the parliament, or to the public at large. Or you could have create, and, and you may hear about this also in the news nowadays, it's so-called independent fiscal councils. So these are organized bodies of uh, fiscal experts <laughs> that assess the, um, uh, the budget and they more importantly they assess the compliance uh, with the fiscal rule and then if a government doesn't comply they write a report about it, they talk to the media and this is being discussed and so this is in a way used as an enforcement tool um, uh, of the government because obviously there is no higher when you don't have a body over the government uh, and, and this is in a way the, the public uh, enforcement that you, you try to achieve. And in, in the Netherlands, this has been very, fairly successful for quite some time. And the United Kingdom is, a, is an example that you may hear about in, in the press. They have called, uh, they have created the so-called Office of Budget Responsibility. And this office, in addition to um, assessing the compliance with the fiscal rule, they even provide the projections, the macroeconomic projections, on which the budget is then formulated. <laughs> Okay, so this is just a slide that shows you with, um, what has happened in the last couple of years and just some, some examples of countries that after the crisis said, okay, we have to do something about our public finances and they have adopted fiscal rules. So, for example, Austria, Colombia, Italy, Portugal, Serbia, Spain, United Kingdom, they have all introduced uh, budget balance rules, debt rule, uh, expenditure rules. So you, you see some, some examples here. Uh, you see also that we have listed Japan and the United States and we call this pay-as-you-go rules. And these are not really numerical rules where you have a target, but this just means if you increase expenditure, you can ex increase expenditure only if you increase revenues by the same amount at the same time. So, but obviously if you already have a deficit of 10% as the United States and Japan have, this does not, doesn't necessarily help you very much in bringing your deficit down, it just helps you to avoid that you um, uh, increase it even further. So actually we are, I think one big thing that the IMF has always pointed out that is missing in Japan and in the United States right now, these are the countries with the highest uh, deficits and, and the highest, uh, some of the highest debt ratios, Japan is the highest country with the highest debt ratio of over 200% of GDP, is they have no um, concrete medium term fiscal plan of reducing um, the, these deficits and debt. And so far the markets always, I mean these two countries have a special position in a way, these are you know, safe haven countries for, for investors and so on, and so far markets have not punished these governments, interest rates are at record low levels. But there's obviously a risk that at some point markets might change their view on these economies, and if these interest rates were to rise, Japan every single year has to roll over 40% of GDP of its debt. And I mean, you can imagine if all of a sudden they have to pay 1% or 2 percentage point more interest on, on this huge level of debt, it has huge implications for, um, for its budget. So that's clearly, clearly a risk and you know, some kind of medium term plan could help. Okay, and, and the... Um, Given that uh, we're already advanced in time, I may just allude to this, um, to this uh, graph here, but we can discuss a bit more maybe in the discussion. This is um, just to familiarize you a little bit with what ha has happened in Europe. And this is very complicated, and even this chart is already complicated. So I think probably what you know is that there were the limits of 3% debt uh, deficit, and there was a 60% uh, limit on, on the debt. But the 60% debt limit was never really enforced. There was also no sanctioning mechanisms. So that is what is here in the second column under Maastricht, and the SGP stands for Stability and Growth Pact. So that was the first version. 
Um, then in 2005, there was a reform. And the reason was that France and Germany, when they were also about to be punished by the European Commission, they said, oh, oh hold on, um, maybe we should change the rules of the game. And uh, I mean, clearly this was not very good for the credibility of the Stability and Growth Pact, but at least it um, uh, provided some, some, you know, some room for discussion and they actually reformed the Stability and Growth Pact and, and included some uh, additional, or they adjusted a little bit um, uh, the pact. And um, because in addition to the debt and the deficit rule, what was always in place is that when the, your economy is growing, over the, on average, you should have a balanced budget. So that was the original, um, what you see here on the structural budget balance rule, it says medium term position should be close to balance or in surplus. And so this is the deficit when you correct for the cycle, for the business cycle. So that should be in surplus or, or in balance. But a lot of countries didn't adhere to it and there was also no repercussions for that. And then during the reform, they adjusted this and they said, okay, we each country should have its own country-specific medium-term target. Say a country like Finland, where the population is aging very, very, very quickly, and where they need uh, money to pay for the pension liabilities, Finland actually said, we want to run an average surplus of 1%. But another country that actually had, you know, I don't know, Estonia has very low debt ratios, they may say, we only have debt of less than 10% of GDP, and that we are growing very fast for us, it's, it's enough if we run small deficits uh, all together. So the, the, the Commission, European Commission, let the countries decide themselves within margins what should be their, their own medium term uh, objectives. Again, I mean, that wasn't really enforceable and the crisis happened. So then in 2011, in response to the, the, uh, the crisis in Europe, new suggestions were made in terms of fiscal governance. And this is the so-called six-pack. And then I mean, it becomes very complicated and maybe just to point out one thing which is very important. There's actually the next column, um, the so-called fiscal compact. Now, um, because some countries never had national rules, they only had this requirement under the EU, for example, Greece, they didn't have any national rules. And they violated the EU rules. So now, the countries agreed that every country has to have a national fiscal rule in place because then you are accountable to your own electorate and hopefully when you're accountable to your own electorate there's more pressure that you actually adhere to that. And so now also Greece um, over the medium term cannot have on average a deficit more than 0.5% uh, um, of GDP. And again, now there are also a bit more enforcement mechanisms in place. So even if you deviate from the 60% deficit target, um, there can be some sanctions. Uh, in the, in the okay, so let me kind of wrap it up and uh, kind of also draw some implications um, for Kosovo. And I think a lot of the, the points that I already made um, are considerations, obviously, that also should be considered when you, you know, when you start or when you design uh, a fiscal rule um, in addition to the, to the debt limit. So I think the, the, the first point was on the broad coverage, so the recommendation, and I think that's also what uh, the, the government has um, uh, laid out in the letter of intent with, with the IMF is to cover the entire general government, but then split it obviously between the center and the municipalities, so there needs to be some clear uh, signed responsibilities. Um, then, um, debt sustainability is the main target, but you need some kind of annual speed limits to not increase the debt ratio too quickly. And uh, so a reasonable target could be 2% um, of GDP. Um, again, that should not be interpreted as a target, but a ceiling. And, um, I mean, I talked a lot about the European um, rules that now correct the deficit for the, for the business cycle. So what they do is they calculate they trend GDP and then they calculate an output gap. So the output gap is the deviation of the actual GDP from the potential GDP. And there are various ways of how you can calculate potential GDP. You can either say you do a trend calculation or you can have some kind of production function. You say, okay, you know, we have uh, uh, labor, you have capital, 
you have uh, technical progress, you calculate, a, say, a Douglas production function, that gives you your, your potential GDP, and where are you now in terms of, of uh, this potential GDP? Again, that's obviously very difficult, especially, say, in Kosovo, an economy that goes through a lot of structural changes. So it's very difficult to say what would be the, the potential GDP. And even using trend GDP is difficult because there's not a long history of data. So clearly that, that's a trade-off. So one has to find something which is a bit more, say, simple in the current circumstances, but still um, fulfills the, uh, the objectives. And that's why I think an overall budget deficit limit would, would be appropriate. Um, obviously, um, a downside, and I should have made that clear earlier, is so when you have a deficit uh, defined as the um, in, in nominal term, a percent of GDP, and then all of a sudden you're hit with a shock, um, uh, and you still have to maintain this deficit, it could mean that the government has to tighten fiscal policy just in a moment when you're getting into a recession. So you could actually, this could actually lead to pro cyclical fiscal policy. So in a way you're making the situation of the, of the economy worse. Um, but this is in a way a price that you have to pay for um, kind of the, the other advantages that you, that you get with it. And this is, again, maybe just quickly, this is an example of um, why. So here you, you have uh, on the horizontal axis nominal GDP growth. And then on the vertical, you have um, the deficit that would stabilize the debt. And then the three graphs that you show you see here, or three lines, is the debt level that would be stabilized. So the green line is 25%. Um, uh, debt to GDP ratio and so on. So now you could, in a way, pick the combination between the nominal GDP growth and the deficit that stabilizes, say, 30% of, of GDP. As th yeah, debt of 30% of GDP. So that, say, that, let's pick the blue line. And say if your economy grows at 6 or 7% annually in nominal terms, that means you can run a deficit of around one and a half to two percent, and that deficit would then stabilize the, the debt ratio at around uh, thirty percent. I mean, this is just a simple debt dynamics uh, graph, but it, I think gives a little bit of the logic what is behind, say, having a deficit of two percent, because that would imply that you um, actually have to maintain an economic growth which is in the order of six or seven percent uh, over time. since we are already advanced. And just kind of a summary also of some other features that are important for fiscal rules in, in Kosovo. Clearly you have very large investment needs. There are still the highways um, that are being built. So um, if um, Kosovo also has still privatization proceeds that it might receive, and the privatization proceeds obviously are not, um, if you use the, those for, for, for the construction of these, in these capital investment projects, they're not creating any debt. In a way, you're trading one asset against another asset. Right? So you, um, you have a stake in enterprise, you sell that, and you, you transform it into an asset of, of capital in terms of, of public investment. Um, they also said the, if you have an overall budget balance, this might create some risk of cyclicality, uh, but you, you can create some flexibility by, by adding things like the escape clauses, or you can also say, okay, what about, I mean, it's a young economy, the economy, structure of the economy might, might change. So let's go maybe after five years, let's go back and look at the key parameters of, of the rule. And then maybe if something has changed, we can also change the parameters. And then um, I think important to stress again is also for enforcement, there should be something, some clear mechanism. If you deviate from a rule, how do you get back? And I think that's probably one of the most important lessons to be learned from, from experiences in the past, that uh, governments have been very good at promising something, but then have been doing something else. So unless there is either a lot of political will, a lot of public pressure, or some kind of automatic mechanisms, uh, there's a risk that this will not be adhered to. Okay, so let me conclude on this. Um, so you've seen there's a, clearly a wave, new wave a, of, of countries that are using fiscal rules. 
Um, <coughs> emerging economies are often economies like Kosovo, you, you, in a way, have the, the, the benefit of learning from the lessons that um, some advanced economies uh, have already drawn. So often these new fiscal rules are much better designed than the old ones. Um, so I think that, that that's what we see. Um, clearly, the rules might, might also be more sophisticated. So then in that sense, it uh, can be helpful to have some kind of public council or somebody from the outside, that um, independent council that, that monitors this. Um, and clearly also it's a challenge for the government. They have to communicate this because the rules might be quite complicated. So you have to be really in a position to clearly explain this. And um, yeah, so I, I would some, uh, kind of end on the note that clearly the, the, the use of fiscal rules is an is a opportunity for, for Kosovo. It puts you in a really good international uh, company. Um, it's, a, it's a chance now to, to design it in a, a comprehensive and, and, and incredible way. And I think it fits very well with the already existing fiscal framework of, uh, and, and uh, the policies of some fiscal policies that uh, the country has uh, engaged on in, in, the, in the last years. Right. And on that note, and happy to take questions um, on any of these topics also. And as I said, on the, if you have questions on EU fiscal <laughs> governance, there's also Attila who with an expert in, in, in that area. Thank you, Gerhard Blair. So, there are open to questions. Um, let's remind you again that both Andrea and Attila bring the international experience, so feel free to ask any questions which may potentially relate with either Eurozone countries or even worldwide. But you can also ask questions uh, specifically for Kosovo as they are here for the second time and I think they are quite knowledgeable about how the system works and, and they can uh, potentially answer the questions, so please. You can start first. Seeing through the graph of countries that uh, have already adopted the fiscal rules across <coughs> the world, I saw that, that many of the countries have of the, who have adopted these rules are already developed and who have run actually high debts. Uh, but our Kosovo has not still run into high debts and, do, and we may not expect a similar trend in the next 10 years maybe. But uh, do you think that adopting fiscal rules for Kosovo is necessarily essential at this stage? Yeah, a lot of countries in a way who had in a way they adopted fiscal rules once their debt was already high and they saw it as a solution to, to bring it down and su successfully did so. Um, but clearly it can also be a safeguard of not getting into the situation that other countries have run into. And I think this is in a way the choice that Kosovo can make uh, at this stage to really have some medium term uh, plan and, and, and sound fiscal policies over, over the medium term. And there are good examples also of countries who had low debt and have done this. So Estonia, for example, is a, is a good case. Um, they I think from the very beginning they had a fiscal rule in place and they are the country now in Europe with one of the highest growth rates and one of the lowest um, uh, debt ratios. So you were also talking about the uh, transparency level of these uh, fiscal rules and also political will to commitment to, to adopt these rules. Um, if we consider the political environment in Kosovo, uh, I, I believe that it's still not at the level where uh, mediums and also media and also uh, public, in a way, uh, work together to build this transparency. Uh, do you think that the adoption of fiscal rules would actually uh, lead to toward even more intransparent? Uh, intransparent relations between the government and, uh, and the public, because our government, we have seen that many many of the works are not actually reported. Yeah, but I think in terms of the principles, um, uh, one of our recommendations also was that there is some kind of um, uh, commitment that um, the government um, uh, reports any deviation from the fiscal uh, compliance with the fiscal. I mean, there's a medium term uh, uh, fiscal expenditure framework which is publicly available, right? So that, that's already a document. 
um, that, that's a, um, in the public domain. And in this document or in any other document, the government would have to explain its, its plans under the fiscal rule. And if it were to deviate from the fiscal rule, again, in this public document, it would have to explain why it deviated from it, and then also how it plans to return and, in a way, undo the deviation um, from the plan. And then clearly it is up to, say, academia or academic people who are, who, who are experts on the matter to actually follow this and then potentially also raise issues if, if there are uh, issues. Clearly another um, body that would be responsible is, is the assembly. Um, so the government would also be then accountable to, you know, to explain deviations through the assembly and I presume some of the meetings are open to the public, they are open to the public, so I don't know which yeah. ones, but so, so there might be another the way of, of um, kind of uh, generating uh, information uh, about this. Question regarding the fiscal rules, uh, because uh, like different countries, like n not one country is is the same with, with the other one. So like I would like to know what, what kind of model did you use in creating the fiscal rules for Kosovo? Because I think like like um, Estonia's uh, example or fiscal model cannot will not work in English. I should say the, the fiscal rule is clearly yes. uh, homemade though because it, it will be the government who will be adopting a rule so it you know draws obviously on it's <coughs> the knowledge of uh, of the of the country of the circumstances of the budgetary institutions and so on. And our input, in a way, was to provide lessons from international experiences, but clearly they have to be adjusted to the specific circumstances. So I think one example um, that we said is, um, for example, how do you treat privatization proceeds? And these can be very large, and I think probably could lead to... So privatization proceeds are, um, just from an accounting point of view, they are booked, we call it like below the line. So they are not part of revenue, so um, even if you have funds that you don't have to create and you don't have to borrow because you, you get these privatization proceeds, you would run relatively high, potentially relatively high deficits. And for many other countries, we would not necessarily recommend to do so. But for the case of Kosovo, it's different because I think it's a clear example that there is investment needs. And so, uh, so if these projects are well defined, there might be a case for actually using these privatization so that's you know, clearly um, uh, targeted towards uh, uh, the circumstances here. Uh, again, also using an overall balance um, in a way is kind of a compromise that you know, adjusts to, to the inability at, at this stage to calculate secretly adjusted uh, balances because of, of the lack of data. And I think a lot of, I mean, the government has uh, taken, uh, uh, the ministry has uh, taken a lot of other things into consideration that specifically reflect the in, in environment. I will just add to this one uh, another element which will kind of implicitly be part of the fiscal rule is the government bank balances uh, and that shows that uh, this is kind of different from other countries because we lack a monetary policy so what the government wants, uh, it intends to keep a certain level of bank balances at the central bank as fiscal agents so that it doesn't come to a point where we end up with no money. So while we can use the privatization proceeds to spend for uh, any investment purposes, we can only do that if the bank balances are at an uh, adequate uh, level. We also discussed with the IMF mission team that because we as a country still face the so-called underspending due to the lack of uh, capacities to implement the planned budget uh, and if that underspending results in excess level of bank balances we can spend that excess in addition to the agreed uh, deficit of let's say 2% or whatever that, that deficit will be. Okay, uh, I am Edinor Castrote. I'm a student of, of the second year at AUK. Um, my question, I totally agree with what, what you just said until now because we need rules in order to assure stability. But my concern is that some countries have too much power, too much voting power, and if, a, let's say, a deep recession hits them, like United States or Japan or Germany, they have the power to change their rules. While if, if Kosovo is in deep recession, <coughs> 
it cannot use these instruments to, to run out of, of the recession. So how do you think that this unbalance of power is um, related to the, to the reliability of, of these rules? Thank you. Maybe just to clarify, so the rules um, that are envisaged um, are national rules. So this, there's no, I mean, at the European level, clearly there's also a, there's a treaty and there's a commitment, an international commitment um, to the specific rules. But in, say, in the case of Kosovo or in the case of the United States, these rules would apply at the national level. And um, to, in, to ensure uh, flexibility if something really unforeseen like a huge recession, like say the current crisis, um, which hasn't hit Kosovo as much as it has, has hit other countries, but say if you were having hit that, that hard, then I think what we foresee is, some, is an escape clause, where you say every 10 years, every 15 years, something big and unforeseen like this happens. So really the, the government should be in a position then to respond. And so in a way it can um, uh, put the, the fiscal rule aside for one or two years until this unforeseen event in a way is, is overcome. But then it has to go back to the rule. And I think that's what we are stressing is it is important to kind of predefine this and not let it to the government to decide is this an unusual event or not. And because there the lessons have been that countries, uh, or there's international experience that countries have abused, so to speak, the, the, this particular power. And then maybe there's another part of your question which says, um, does a small economy have the ability to actually stimulate the economy if, if need be? And clearly the more open an economy is, um, the more difficult uh, it is because, you know, what, say if you were to reduce taxes, um, some of these, uh, the extra uh, income that a, uh, a resident has might be used to, to, uh, for imports. So you might not have the full effect. So what we call the multipliers, they're typically smaller in, in, in small open economies. But that's something separate um, uh, from the history. Thanks, Andrea. It was an interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, going back to Kosovo debt again, and you mentioned 40% like a maybe more uh, like a ceiling rather than a tar target. Um, uh, I would like to uh, know what is your taking on this, let's say this 40%, why not a 60%, why not a 30 or 20%? Uh, because I was just thinking in the meantime about Albania's case, because initially uh, when the transition started, they, they also, like Kosovo, they, they didn't have a high debt, but then it actually accumulated in a very uh, short period of time. So I was uh, wondering, what is your taking on this, especially if we have a government or uh, a situation in Kosovo that we tend to have election maybe every year or every second year, and we might end up maybe uh, seeing governments and ending up in very reckless policies. So I would like to maybe your own opinion or even IMF's opinion on this particular issue. Thank you. Well, I think that's a, a very difficult, but very, very relevant and, and topical question in a way. It's what is the appropriate level of debt, or what level of debt is sustainable? And I mean, there's a lot of empirical and analytical work being done on this, but again, it depends very much on the country. And just this one um, graph that I showed is already an indication that, um, say, if a country, I mean, I said you, you can run, say, deficits of um, 2% if you grow at 7%, but if you were to go down, and you, you have, uh, say you have Italy, which is growing only zero or, or one percent, I mean, you have hardly any growth, you already have debt of a hundred percent, they have to run primary surpluses. And if you know that an economy for a certain reason cannot run primary surpluses, because there's no willingness to do so, then that debt that, that, that level is clearly not sustainable. Um, so, I mean, I think you have to take all these individual factors into account. What we, what we find is, so some colleagues have done some studies on the link between debt ratios and growth, and see at what, is there kind of a threshold that, at what debt level does all of a sudden too much debt increases interest rates, has a negative uh, implication also for investor sentiment, and then in a way you crowd out um, uh, uh, private uh, investment, and that reduces debt, uh, reduces growth. And so they find um, thresholds which are in the order of 70% for advanced economies, and they find some lower levels, 
around 40-50% for, for emerging economies. But again, that's a cross-country study, so then obviously you have to look individually at, uh, at death, uh, death thresholds. And, and yeah, what, also, what is the, in a way the, the maximum, say, primary surplus you can maintain over a certain period of time um, that, that maintain your, your data level. So, but that's clearly a very, very difficult question. I mean, maybe I can go to one slide that I had skipped just to make this point. So, um, this particular chart um, it shows a range of transition economies, and you see in the dark, in the dark bars are the debt, debt to GDP ratios uh, at end 2007, and most of them are below the red line. So, most of them have debt ratios far below uh, 30%. I think the exceptions are Poland, Hungary, uh, yeah. Um, but then, I mean, this is just an indication how quickly your debt ratio can jump, and not so much because of your own wrongdoing, but in this case, of because of the global uh, global crisis. So within four years, many of them jumped over 30 percent, and many even jumped over uh, uh, 40 percent. So for for advanced economies, it's even worse. I think the average increase for advanced economies um, when you weight it by um, GDP is 40% during the crisis. So from 2007 to 2012, 40% of GDP uh, increase. So I think it's just an illustration that uh, obviously this is not something that we expect to happen, I mean, this size of the shock to, to happen uh, very regularly. But again, I think it's an indication that having some buffer um, and not you know, already being at very high, high levels of debt is, uh, I think, is a reasonable. Uh, having you regard the financial crisis that it's ongoing in Europe, in uh, most, in some of the major countries, and knowing that Kosovo relies on remittances from from abroad uh, a lot on their on the revenues, especially. So, so how how can the, the ongoing financial crisis in, in Europe hinder the the, the new fiscal rules that, that will be in effect? I mean, I hope we, it will not hinder the, the implementation of the rule, but I mean, you are, I think, right to point out that uh, there might be a risk for the, the growth projections, obviously, for, for Kosovo going forward. If I recall the numbers correctly, I think two-thirds of the remittances come from Germany and Switzerland, and so in Germany, growth has been, um, Germany came through the crisis relatively well, and uh, unemployment is still on a, on a downward trend. Uh, but there's clearly also a risk that um, Germany is slowing down and maybe the labor market deteriorates a bit. Um, and that could potentially have spillover effects then also um, uh, to your economy. Um, I'm not an expert in terms of how, how large um, that is, but I think it's already included in the, in the projections for, for next, for next yeah. year. Right? Um, uh, currently, if you look at the midterm expansion <coughs> framework, which is a three-year document, uh, there is no projection that uh, <coughs> relative terms remittances will drop. So we account for a continuation of those remittances. But it is true that in case of any significant drop, that will significantly affect the growth. And if the gross growth is affected, the revenues will be affected. That will lead to, again, uh, a fiscal difficulties for the for the government. Obviously if we have the fiscal rule in place in, in relative terms we would have to still run a two percent deficit but that means uh, the budget would have to be cut so that you're within the then, hello my name is Anton Arti and I was just wondering what you would be what would uh, suggestion of yours be for Kosovo's economy if you should be take on a debt load fast or since it's not known as an export economy and it's more known as an import economy and what your suggestions would be like that. as also the professor mentioned in Albania they did have a government which took on a heavy debt load very quickly and what do you expect for Kosovo? I mean I think um, our recommendation or it's in a way reflected in what, what um, uh, the government has proposed uh, right now as part of the letter of intent. 
is to, pro um, to um, implement the speed limits of deficits of not more than 2% per year. So you can obviously use <coughs> the f funding from the privatization proceeds to, to finance investment uh, and capital, but the debt financing um, should not uh, increase more than 2% um, uh, per year at this stage. That, that's uh, our recommendation. I mean, with, I mean, with the perspective of the debt sustainability, but also I think uh, from a perspective of what is the capacity of the economy to actually absorb all these capital projects. Is there maybe even a risk to you know, um, run into some overheating in, say, the, the construction sector and, and then create some inefficiencies or potentially create some inflation that might even deteriorate the competitive position? I think so these are considerations that um, uh, one more question, if there is no. any more comments? Do you want to add something? I just want to say something about the euro area countries because uh, actually not only the euro area countries but the European Union countries. Because we look at those countries with like, more than two, sometimes three uh, fiscal <coughs> budget rules and we I can help myself either to smile when I see that these countries with the most rules have the highest fiscal deficit and debt uh, uh, compared to GDP. But it's, to be fair to these countries, we have to realize where these rules come from. They come from the 90s, where these countries were preparing to create a currency union. So the idea was not to do something about the fiscal position as such, but to do something about the fiscal position to converge in an area that would be similar among the original 15 to be ready for a currency union. So it is a convergence criterion. It's not a fiscal rule in itself, as some countries may consider right now, like Kosovo, where there is a need for political reasons and expected economic growth or development to put in place fiscal rules. But a different type of de development that was expected at the same time for 15 countries that had to become economically similar to be ready for currency union. Now, the 11 first countries they managed to do so. And when you look at what happened after the Maastricht Treaty, it really helped those countries. Their debt levels did decline. And their deficit levels, if they were not right already before that, they got it up in order to be ready for the currency union. Now, what happened afterwards is more of an enforcement issue. Andrea touched upon it briefly. I just want to add to that that in the European Union, fiscal, no, not fiscal rules, but the rules in general, the Guardian is the European Commission, except for a few policy areas, and one of them is fiscal policy. For fiscal policy, the Guardian of the EU rules is not the Commission, which is what you would consider maybe as a government, um, but it's the Council, and the Council is a group of ministers of finance, it's peer review. So when in 2004 Germany and France they're uh, getting close to the point that they had to be penalized for it. It was the same, their colleagues sitting at the table looking at each other, are we going to do this or not? Are we going to penalize the two largest countries of the euro area? Or shall we keep quiet? And they decided to keep quiet. Now, would the Commission have done the same? We don't know, but I can compare it with other policy areas. The Commission, until now, for 60 years now, they have never refrain from penalizing countries in other policy areas. France giving state aid to their steel industry, Italy giving state aid to their airlines, uh, they all had to get it back. State aid rules are enforced by the Commission. Um, but fiscal policy is in the hands of the Council, which is more like a political body and peer review apparently didn't work. Now there's also the issue of all the escape clauses. Uh, the escape clauses are, doesn't matter how well you define them, and it's my role, I guess, as a lawyer, because I'm an economist, uh, to translate economic choices into legal rules, or to apply legal rules to economic realities, that how ma no matter how good you define them, it's in the end a administrative application, if not a court uh, enforced system. And what we see there is that some countries have joined the euro area, um, with really high debt levels. 
Belgium, I think, at the time in Italy, were over 100%. And it was only possible, well, they were only 60%. It was only possible because one of the escape clauses was that if over the last couple of years your debt level was decreasing at a, at a steady uh, pace, that was okay. So you could go from 110 to 19 to 18. So the idea would be, well, at some point you will end up with a 60. So that's good. Well, about 100. See? Just to be fair to these countries. So the idea of if you have a lot of rules that you will uh, incur problems, which may be like one of the conclusions you can draw from the, the map that was shown, is not the right one. We have to keep in mind where those rules come from, that they were very effective in the 90s to get these countries ready for the currency union, and that something happened along the way in the enforcement. And that's what I typically would uh, emphasize when discussing fiscal rules. It's one thing to put the rule in place, and the other one is to apply it, which apparently is difficult. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Lila. Thank you to the audience, students, faculty, and faculty.